Chapter 7 of In the Field, 1914-1915. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by FNH. In the Field, 1914-1915. By Marcel Dupont. Chapter 7. Chapter 7. Sister Gabrielle. It was a very dark night. How were we to find our way about the little unknown town of Elverding, near which our regiment had just been quartered? We could hardly make out the low houses with closed windows and long roofs of thatch or slate, and kept stumbling on the greasy and uneven cobblestones. Now and again the corner of a street or the angle of a square was lit up dimly by a ray of light filtering through half-closed shutters. I went along haphazard, preceded by my friend B., we were quite determined to find beds and to sleep in peace. After our four days' fighting near Big Shoot, we had been sent to the rear ten kilometres away from the line of fire to get twenty-four hours' rest, had arrived at nightfall, and found much difficulty in putting up our men and horses in the small farms around the town. But no sooner had they all found places, no sooner had the horses got their nose-bags on and the kitchen fires been lighted, than B., who was always anxious about the comforts of his board and lodging, said to me, There is only one thing for us to do. We are to rest. We must find a bed and a well-furnished table. I'd rather go to bed an hour later and sleep between sheets after a good meal than lie down at once on straw with an empty stomach. Listen to me. Let us go on to that nice Belgian town over there, only a few steps further. It is hardly ten o'clock. It will be devilish bad luck if we can't find a good supper and good quarters. We need not trouble about anything else. Let us think first of serious matters. So we started for the little town, which seemed to be wrapped in sleep. We knocked at the doors, but no one opened. No doubt the houses were all full of soldiers. No one offered us any hospitality, in spite of all B's obdurations, now beseeching, now imperious. In despair I suggested at last that we should go back to our squadron and lie down by our horses. But B would not hear of it, and still clung to his idea to have a good dinner and sleep in a bed. Just then we saw a dark figure creeping noiselessly along under a wall. B at once went up to it and caught it by the arm. It was a poor old woman carrying a basket and a jug of milk. He said, Madame, madame, uh, have pity on two poor, weary, half-starved soldiers. But she couldn't give us any information, speaking in bad French, interspersed with Flemish, she gave us to understand that the little town was full of troops, and at that hour everybody was asleep. And what is there in that large white building, where the windows are alight? The good woman explained that it was a convent, where nuns took in the old people of the country. They could not give lodging to soldiers, but B had already made up his mind. That was where we were to sleep. Leaving the old woman aghast, he went with long strides to the iron railing which surrounded a little garden in front of the convent. I tried in vain to make him understand that we could not invade these sacred precincts. "'Leave it to me,' he said. "'I'll speak to them.' He pushed the iron gate, which opened with a creak, and I shut it after him. I felt somewhat uneasy as I followed B, who crossed the garden with a rapid stride. I felt uneasy at the thought of his essentially military eloquence, and of the use to which he proposed to put it. But I knew, too, that he was not easily induced to abandon a resolution he had once taken." True, he did not often make one, but this time he seemed to be carrying out a very definite plan. The best thing was to submit and await the result of his attempt. We went up three steps and felt for the knocker. Here it is, said B, and he lifted it and knocked hard. What a dismal sound it made in that sleeping town. I felt as though we had just committed an act of sacrilege. We listened and heard through the door the noise of chairs dragged over the stone floor then a light footstep approaching, a sound of keys and bolts, and the door was gently opened and held ajar. B, with a bow, what we are doing is this, I know most unusual, but we are dying of hunger and very tired, and so far nobody has been willing to open their door to us. Could we not have something to eat here, and sleep in a bed? The sister looked at us, and appeared not to understand. However, I was more at ease when I saw she was neither frightened nor displeased. She was a very old nun, dressed in black, and held in her hand a little lamp which flickered in the night breeze. Her face was furrowed with deep wrinkles, 
and her skinny hand held before the lamp seemed transparent. She made up her mind at once. Her face lit up with a kind smile, and she signed to us to come in with words which were probably friendly. This was a supposition, for the worthy nun only spoke Flemish, and we could not understand anything she said. She carefully pushed the bolts again, placed a lamp on the floor, and made a sign for us to wait. Then she went away with noiseless steps, and we were left alone. "'You see?' said B. "'It is all going swimmingly. Now that we have got in, you must leave everything to me.' The flickering lamp lighted the hall dimly. The walls were bare, and there was no furniture but some rush chairs set in a line against the partition. Opposite the door there was a simple wooden crucifix, and the stretched-out arm seemed to bid us welcome. A perfume of hot soup came from the door the old sister had just shut. "'I say,' said B. "'did you smell it? I believe it is cabbage soup, and if so I shall take a second helping.' "'Just wait a bit,' I replied. "'I'll wager they're going to turn us out.' From the other side of the door, by which the portess had just disappeared, we heard a voice calling, "'Sister Gabrielle! Sister Gabrielle!' And a moment after the same door opened, and another nun came in very quietly and rather embarrassed, it seemed to me. She came towards us. "'Sister Gabrielle, your modesty will certainly suffer from all the good I am going to say of you. But I am wrong. You will not suffer. For you certainly will never read the pages I have scribbled during the course of this war.' at odd times, as I could, in bivouacs and billets. But I have vowed to keep a written record of the pictures which have charmed or moved me most during this campaign. If I ever survive it, I want to be able to read them again in my latter days. I want to have them read by those who belong to me, and to show them what kind of life we led during those unforgettable days. And it is not always the battles which leave the most lively impressions. How many delightful things one could relate that have happened outside the sphere of action! What memories of nights passed in the strangest places, as the chances of the march decreed, nights of bitterness during the retreat, nights of fever during the advance, nights of depression in the trenches! What kindly welcomes, what beautiful and what noble figures one might describe! Sister Gabrielle, as you will never read this, and as your modesty will not suffer, let me tell the story of the welcome my friend B and I received that evening at the Covenant of Elverding. Sister Gabrielle came towards us. How pretty she was in the coif that framed her face! How large her blue eyes looked! They really were so, but a touch of excitement made them seem larger still. Above all, she had an enchanting smile, a smile of such kindness that we at once felt at ease and sure of obtaining what we wanted. She spoke in a sweet and musical voice, hesitating just a little in the choice of her words, although she spoke French very correctly. "'The Sister Superior has sent me to you,' she said, "'because I am the only one here who can speak French. Messieurs les officers, welcome.' She said it quite simply, and stood quite straight in her black dress, her arms hanging beside her. She might have been a picture of other days, an illuminated figure from a missile, we looked at each other, and smiled too, happy to find so unexpected a welcome. B was now quite self-possessed. "'Sister Gabrielle,' he said, "'see what a wretched state we are in. Our clothes covered with mud, our faces not washed since I don't know when. We have just gone four days without sleep, almost without food, and we have never stopped fighting. Could you not take in two weary, famished soldiers for one night?' Sister Gabrielle retained her wonderful smile. Without moving her arms, she slightly raised her two hands, which showed white against the black cloth of her dress. Those hands seemed to say, I should like to very much, but I cannot. And at the same time the smile said, We ought not to, but it shall be managed nevertheless. Come, she said, in any case we can give you something to eat. And she took up the little lamp. She went first, opened the door at the end of the passage, and we followed her, delighted. We were dazzled as we came into this new room by the brilliance of the lamps that lit it. It was the convent kitchen. How clean and bright everything was! The copper saucepans shone resplendently. The black and white pavement looked like an ivory chessboard. Two sisters were sitting peeling vegetables which they threw into a bowl of water. An enormous pot on the well-polished stove was humming its inviting monotone. 
It was this pot which exhaled the delicious smell that had greeted us when we entered the house. The whole picture recalled one of Bale's appetizing canvases. The two sisters raised their eyes, looked at us, and, yes, they smiled too. B was feeling eloquent, wanted to make a speech, but Sister Gabrielle hurried us on. Come, come, she said. It is not worth while. They wouldn't understand you. She opened another door, and we went into a small rectangular room. Whilst our guide hastened to light the lamp hanging above the table, we laid our kits on the window sill, our revolvers, shakos, binocular cases and map cases. And how tarnished and dirty the things were after those three months of war. We ourselves felt fairly ashamed to be seen in such a state. Our coats worn and stained, our breeches patched, our huge boots covered with mud, all formed a strange contrast to the room we were in. It was provided throughout with large cupboards in the walls, the doors of which reached to the ceiling. These doors were of polished wood and shone like a mirror. The floor was like another mirror, that indicafatable chatterer bee gave another speech. Sister, please excuse the costumes of fighting men. We must look like ruffians, but we are honest folk. If our faces do not inspire such confidence, it is simply because our stomachs are so empty. And no one would more resembles a vagabond than a poor wretch who is dying with hunger. You will not know us again after we have had a few words with the pot, which gave us such a savoury smell as we passed. Sister Gabriel did not cease to smile. With wonderful rapidity and skill, she opened one of the cupboards, and from the piles of linen picked out a checkered red and white tablecloth, with which she covered the table. In a moment she had arranged places for two, opposite each other. "'Sit down,' she said, "'and rest. I will go and fetch you something to eat.' B followed her to the door. "'Sister Gabrielle,' he said, "'we have found a paradise.' But she had already shut the door, and we heard her in the kitchen, stimulating the zeal of the other two nuns in Flemish. We sat down, delighted. What a long time since we had enjoyed such comfort! Everything there seemed designed to charm our eyes and to rest our minds. There was no noise in the street, and the convent itself would have seemed wrapped in sleep had it not been for the voices in the next room. But the distant roar of the guns still went on, and seemed to make our respite still more enjoyable. We hardly heard Sister Gabrielle when she came in and put down the steaming soup before us. The delicate perfume of the vegetables made our mouths water. For many days past we had had nothing to eat but our rations of tinned meat, and all that time we had not been able to light a fire to cook anything at all. So we fell too eagerly upon our well-filled plates. B even lost the power of speech for the moment. Meanwhile the pretty little sister, without appearing to look at us, was cutting bread and then she brought a jug of golden beer. What a treat it was! Why couldn't it be like this every day? In that case the campaign would have seemed almost like a picnic. Whilst I was eating I could not help admiring Sister Gabrielle. She looked so refined in her modest black clothes. Her slightest movements were as harmonious as those of an actress on the stage. But she was nature in all she did, and the grace of every movement was instinctive. As she placed before us an imposing-looking omelette au lard, that rascal B, who had already swallowed two plates of soup and four large glasses of beer, began to maunder thus. Sister Gabrielle? Sister Gabrielle, I don't want to go away tomorrow. I want to end my days here with the old people you look after. Look at me. I am getting old too, and we have been severely tried by life. Why shouldn't I stay here where I am? I should have a nice little bed in the old people's dormitory, with nice white sheets, go to bed every evening on the stroke of eight, and you, sister, would come and tuck me up. I should sleep, and eat cabbage soup, and drink good beer, your health. Sister, and I shouldn't think any more about anything at all. How nice it would be. No more uniform to strap up after a good dinner. No more shako to squeeze your temples, no more bullets whistling past you. No more coal boxes to upset your whole system and every evening a bed, a nice bed, and to think about nothing. Hush, listen, said Sister Gabrielle, with a finger on her lips. At that moment the noise of the firing became louder. The Germans had no doubt just made a night attack, either on Big Chute or Stienstraat, and now every piece was firing rapidly all along the line. So fast did the reports follow one another, 
that they sounded like a continuous growl. However, the noise seemed to be dominated by the reports that came from a battery of heavy guns, long 120s, two kilometres from Elviding, which made all the windows of the convent rattle. I shuddered as I thought of those thousands of shells hurtling through the darkness for miles to reduce so many living human beings to poor, broken and bleeding things. And I pictured to myself our Prussians of Bixute sprawling on the ground with their teeth set and their heads hidden among the beetroot, waiting until the hurricane had passed to get up again and rush forward with their bayonets cheering. Sister Gabrielle had the same thought, no doubt. She looked still whiter than before under her white coif and clasping her hands and lowering her eyes, she said in a low voice, Mon Dieu, Mon Dieu, it is horrible. Sister Gabrielle, continued the incorrigible bee, don't let us talk of such things. Let us rather discuss this omelette, a dish worthy of the gods, and the bacon in it, the savour of which might imperil a saint. Sister Gabrielle, you tempt us this evening to commit the sin of gluttony, which is most venial of all sins, and I will bear the burden of it manfully. I kicked B under the table, to stop his incongruous remarks. But Sister Gabrielle seemed not to have listened to him. She went on serving us similarly, changed our plates, and brought us ham and cheese. B went on devouring everything that was put before him, but this did not stop his divagations. Tell me, Sister Gabrielle, you are not going to turn us out of the house now, are you? It would be an offence against God, who commands us to pity travellers. And we are poor, wretched travellers. If you drive us away, we shall have to sleep on the grass by the roadside with stones for our pillows. No, you couldn't treat us so cruelly. I feel sure that in a few minutes you will show me the bed in the dormitory you will keep for me when I come to take up my quarters with you after the war. Sister Gabrielle's smile had disappeared. For the first time she seemed really distressed. She stopped in front of B, and looked at him with her large clear eyes. She made the same gesture as before lifted up both of her hands in token of powerlessness, and seemed to be thinking how she could avoid hurting our feelings. Then she said in a disheartened tone, "'But we have not a single spare bed.' A long silence followed this sentence, which seemed to plunge B into despair. The guns continued their ominous booming, making the windows rattle terribly. I too now thought that it would be dreadful to leave the house, and go look for our troops in the dark, and put our men in the inconvenience of making room for us on their straw. So I too looked at Sister Gabrielle imploringly. All at once she seemed to have decided what to do. She began by opening one of the cupboards in the wall, took out of it two small glasses with long tapering stems, and placed them before us with a goodly bottle of Hollands. She had recovered her exquisite smile, and she hurried, for she seemed anxious to put her idea into execution. There, drink, it's good Hollands, and we give it to our poor old people on festivals. Thank you, sister, thank you. But she had already run out of the room, and we were left there, happy enough, sipping our glass of Hollands, and enjoying the luxurious peace that surrounded us. The gums seemed to be further off. We only heard a distant growling in the direction of Epes. Our eyelids began to droop and there was almost a pleasure to feel the weariness of our limbs and heads, for now we felt that Sister Gabrielle would not send us away. She came back into the room with a candle in her hand. Come, she said. She was now quite rosy, and seemed ashamed, as though she were committing a fault. We followed her enchanted, and went back through the kitchen, now dark and deserted. The flickering light of the candle was reflected here and there on the curves of the copper pots and glass bowls. The house was sleeping. We crossed the hall, and went up a broad wooden staircase, polished and shining. What a strange party we were, the youthful sister going in front, treading so softly, and we two soldiers, dusty, tattered and squalid, trying to make as little noise as possible with our heavy, hobnailed boots. The nun's rosary clicked at each step against a bundle of keys that hung from her girdle. I was walking last and enjoying the curious picture. The light fell only on Sister Gabrielle. As she turned on the landing, the feeble ray from below threw her delicate features into relief, her fine nose, her childish mouth, with its constant smile. Our own shadows appeared upon the wall in fantastic shapes. Certainly, we had never received so strange and unexpected a welcome. We passed a high oak door, surmounted by a cross and a pediment with Latin inscription. Sister Gabrielle crossed herself and bowed her head. "'The chapel,' she said in a low voice. 
and she went quickly on to the accompaniment of her clinking rosary and keys. As we began to go up the second flight of stairs, B. resumed his monologue in a whisper. "'Sister Gabrielle, Sister Gabrielle, you are an angel from paradise. Surely God can refuse you nothing. You will pray for me this evening, won't you? For I am a great sinner.' "'Oh, yes, of course I shall pray for you,' she answered softly, as she turned towards us. We came out on a long passage, bare and whitewashed. Half a dozen doors could be distinguished at regular intervals, all alike. Sister Gabrielle opened one of them, and we followed her in. We found ourselves in a small room, austerely furnished with two little iron bedsteads, two little deal tables, and two rush chairs. Above each bed there was a crucifix, with a branch of box attached to it, each table had a tiny white basin and a little tiny water jug. All this was very nice and amply sufficient for us. Everything was clean, bright, and polished. Thank you, sister. We shall be as comfortable as possible. But one thing. We shall sleep like tops. Will there be any one to wake us? At what time do you want to get up? At six, sister, punctually, as soldiers must, you know. Oh, then I will see to it. We have mass at four o'clock every morning. "'At four o'clock!' exclaimed B. "'Every morning!' "'Very well, sister. "'To show you we are not miscreants, "'wake us at half-past three, "'and we will go to Mass too. "'But it isn't allowed. "'It is our Mass in our chapel. "'No, no, you must sleep. "'Get to bed quickly. "'Good night. "'I will wake you at six o'clock. "'Good night, sister Gabrielle. "'Good night. "'We shall be so comfortable. "'You see, you had some spare beds after all.' "'Oh, yes, we had.' One can always manage, somehow. And she went off, shutting the door behind her. And now B and I thought of nothing but the luxury of sleeping in a bed. How delightful it would be after our sleepless nights in the fogs of the trenches. But what was that noise resounding through the convent? What was that knocking and those wailing cries? There was someone at the door, hammering at the knocker, someone weeping and sobbing in the dark. I opened my window and leant out but the front door had already been opened, and a figure slipped in hurriedly. The sobs came up the stairs to our door, and women's voices, Sister Gabrielle's voice, speaking Flemish, and another voice, sounding like a death-rattle, trying in vain to pronounce words through choking sobs. How horrible that monotonous, inconsolable, continual wail was! It went on for a short time, and then doors were opened and shut, and voices died away, and suddenly the noise ceased. B. had already got into bed, and from under the sheets he begged me in a voice muffled by the bedclothes to put the candle out quickly. But I was haunted by that moaning, though I could not hear it any longer. I wanted to know what tragedy had caused those sobs. I could not doubt that the horrible war was at the bottom of it. And yet we were a long way from the firing line. My curiosity overcome my fatigue. I put on my jacket and went out, taking the candle with me. I ran down two staircases and my footsteps seemed to wake the dismal echoes in the silent convent. Just as I came to the hall, Sister Gabrielle also arrived with a small lantern in her hand. I must have frightened her, for she started and gave a little scream. But she soon recovered, and guessed what had disturbed me. She told me all about it in a few simple sentences. A poor woman had fled from her village carrying her little girl of eighteen months. As she was running distractedly along the road from Luzerne to Bosheng, a German shell had fallen and a fragment of it had killed her baby in her arms. She had just come six kilometres in the dark, clasping the little corpse to her breast in an agony of despair. She got to Elverding, and knocked at the door of the convent, knowing that there she would find a refuge. And all along the road she had passed convoys, relief troops and dispatch riders. But she took no heed of them. She was obsessed by one thought, to find a shelter for the remains of what had been her joy and hope of her life. "'Just come,' said Sister Gabrielle. "'I will let you see her. "'We have put her poor little body in the mortuary's chamber, "'and Sister Elizabeth is watching there.' "'I followed Sister Gabrielle, who opened a small door "'and went down a few steps. "'We crossed a paved court. "'Her lantern and my candle cast yellowish gleams "'upon the high walls of the buildings. "'Heavy drops of rain were falling, "'making a strange noise on the stones, "'and a kind of anguish seized me "'when I again heard the continuous wailing "'of the unhappy mother.' Sister Gabrielle opened a low door very gently, and we went in. I must confess that I had been much less moved when, 
after the first day of the battle of the marne we passed through a wood where our artillery had reduced a whole german regiment to a shapeless mass of human fragments here i realized all the horror of war that men should kill each other in defence of their homes is conceivable enough and i honour those who fall but it passes all understanding why the massacre should include these poor weak and innocent creatures and sights such as this one i saw in that little mortuary chapel inspire a fierce thirst for vengeance on a kind of large table covered with a white cloth the poor body was laid out it bore no trace of any wound and the little white face seemed to be smiling the good nuns had covered the shabby clothes with an embroidered cloth upon that they had crossed the little hands which seemed to be clasping a tiny crucifix and over the whole they had strewn an armful of flowers on each side they had placed silver candlesticks and the reddish candlelight made golden reflections in the curly locks of the little corpse crouching on the ground by the side of it i saw a shapeless heap of clothes which seemed to be shaken by convulsive spasms it was from this heap that the monotonous wailing came it was the young mother weeping for her little one one felt that nothing could console her and that words would only increase her suffering besides she had not even raised her head when we went in it was best to leave her alone since they say that tears bring comfort on the other side a young sister was kneeling at a prie-dieu telling her rosary sister gabrielle knelt down on the ground beside her i longed to do something to lessen that grief and help the poor woman a little she must have come there in a state of destitution her clothes revealed her poverty but i durst not disturb either her mourning or her prayers and i came out quietly on tiptoe outside the rain which was now falling heavily refreshed my fevered head somewhat i crossed the courtyard quickly but my candle went out and i had some trouble in relighting it which was very necessary as i had to find my way in a maze of doors and passages at last i reached my staircase and passed the landing and the sisters chapel i heard a distant clock strike midnight went up another story and opened our door noiselessly i thought that b would perhaps be waiting for me impatiently anxious to learn the reason for all the noise but b was snoring with the bedclothes over his ears at six o'clock some one knocked at our door and i opened my eyes daylight showed faintly through the open window i wondered where i was and suddenly remembered elverding the convent is it you sister gabrielle i asked oh yes it's i get up i've been knocking for more than an hour b sat up in his bed i did the same and told him what i had seen the evening before he shook his head mournfully and concluded well it's war i hope they'll have a good breakfast ready for us we hurried through our dressings and ablutions for we had to get back quickly to our quarters as we came out of our room lively and refreshed we met sister gabrielle who seemed to have been waiting for us she asked us how we had slept and to stop the flood of eloquence that b was on the point of letting loose she said that's right you should thank me later on come down now your breakfast is waiting for you it will get cold but on passing the chapel b would insist on seeing it sister gabrielle hesitated a moment and then gave way as you would to a child for the sake of peace she opened the outer door and smiled indulgently as if anxious to humour all our whims we passed through an ante-room and then entered the chapel it was quite small only large enough to hold about twenty people the walls were white without any ornament and panelled up to about the height of a man the altar was extremely simple and decorated with a few flowers some rush chairs completed the plenishings of the sanctuary where the good sisters of elverding assembled every morning at four o'clock for prayers as we came out of this humble chapel i noticed two mattresses laid in a corner of the little ante-room and who sleeps here then sister i asked sister gabrielle turned red as a poppy i had to repeat my question twice when lowering her eyes she answered sister elizabeth sister elizabeth and i sister gabrielle sister gabrielle then that little room and those two little beds where we slept were yours hush please come to breakfast at once and light as a bird she disappeared down the staircase so quickly that her black veil floated high above her as though to hide her confusion and we saw no more of sister gabrielle it was a very old woman one of the inmates 
who brought us our hot milk and coffee, our brown bread and fresh butter, in the dining-room with the high cupboards of polished wood. She explained that at this hour the nuns were busy attending to the old folk, and it was no use begging to see our little hostess again. We were told it would be against the rules, and we felt that the curtain had now indeed fallen upon this charming act of the weary tragedy. Only, just as we were passing out of the convent gate for the last time, the old lady put into our hands a big packet of provisions wrapped up in a napkin. She had brought it hidden under her apron. Here, she told me to give you this, and to say that she will pray for you. Our hearts swelled as we heard the heavy door close behind us, and whilst we went away silently along the broken and muddy road, we thought of the sterling hearts that are hidden under the humble habits of the convent. Sister Gabrielle, I shall never forget you. Never will your delicate features fade from my memory, and I seem to see you still going on up that great wooden staircase, lit up by the flickering flame of the candle, when you and Sister Elizabeth gave up your bed so simply and unostentatiously to the two unknown soldiers. End of chapter 7 Recording by FNH Visit www.bookranger.co.uk of in the field 1914-1915 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by f n h in the field 1914-1915 by marcel dupont chapter 8 christmas night mon lieutenant mon lieutenant is 2 o'clock my faithful wattelot held the flickering candle just in front of my eyes to rouse me. What torture it is to be snatched from sleep at such an early hour! It would not be anything in summer, but it was the 24th of December, and it was my turn to go on duty in the trenches. A nice way of keeping Christmas! I turned over in my bed, trying to avoid that light that tormented me. I collected my thoughts, which had wandered far away whilst I was asleep, and had been replaced by exquisite dreams, dreams of times in peace, of welfare, of good cheer, and of gentle warmth. Then I remembered. I had to take command of a detachment of a hundred troopers of the regiment, who were to replace the hundred now in the trenches. It was nearly a month since we had joined our army corps near R, and every other day the regiment had to furnish the same number of men to occupy a sector of the trenches. It was my turn, on the 24th of December, to replace my brother officer and good friend, Lieutenant de la G, who had occupied the post since the 22nd. I'd forgotten all this. How cold it was! <sighs> Whilst Wattelot was taking himself off, I braced myself for the necessary effort of getting out of the warm sheets. Like a coward, I kept on allowing myself successive respites, vowing to rise heroically after each. I will get up as soon as Wattelot has reached the landing of the first floor. I will get up when I hear him walking on the pavement of the hall, or rather when I hear the entrance door shut, and his boots creaking on the gravel path. But every noise was hushed. Wattelot was already some way off, and I still shied at this act, which, after all, was inevitable, to get out of bed in a little ice-cold room at two o'clock in the morning. Through the window, which had neither shutter nor curtain, I saw a small piece of the sky, beautifully clear, in which myriads of stars were twinkling. The day before, when I came in to go to bed, it was freezing hard. That morning the frost, I thought, must be terrible. Come up! With a bound I was on the ground, and rushed at once to the little pitch-pine washstand. Rapid ablutions would wake me up thoroughly. Horror! The water in the jug was frozen. Oh, not very deeply, no doubt but all the same I had to break a coating of ice that had formed on the surface. However, I was happy to feel more nimble after having washed my face. Quick, two warm waistcoats under my jacket, my large cloak with its cape, my fur gloves, my campaigning cap pulled over my ears, and there I was, with a candle in my hand, going down the grand staircase of the chateau. For I was quartered in a chateau. The very word makes one think of a warm room, well upholstered and well furnished, with soft carpets and comfortable armchairs. But, alas, it was nothing of the sort. The good lady, whose house it was, had provided for all contingencies. 
The family rooms had been prudently dismantled and double-locked. A formidable concierge had the keys, and I was happy indeed when I found the butler's room in the attics. His bed, with its white sheets, seemed to me very desirable. And then, as we say in time of peace, one must take things as they come. The open hall door let in a wave of cold air, which struck cold on my face. But I had not a minute to lose. The detachment was to start at half-past two punctually, and it had, no doubt, already formed up in the marketplace. I hurried into the street. The tall pines of the park stood out black against the silver sky, which with bare branches on the other trees formed thousands of arabesques and strange patterns all round. Not the slightest noise was to be heard in this limpid, diphanous night, in which the air seemed as pure and rare as the summits of the lofty mountains. Under my footsteps the gravel was soft, but once I'd got outside of the iron gate I found myself on ground as hard as stone. The mud formed by recent rains, and the ruts hollowed by streams of convoys had frozen, and the road was a maze of furrows and inequalities which made me stumble again and again. In front of the Hotel des Lacs, a certain number of the men had already lined up in front of their horses. Huddled in their cloaks with collars turned up, they were stamping their feet and blowing onto their hands. It must have been a real torture for them, too, to come out of their straw litter, where they were sleeping so snugly a few moments before, rolled up in their blankets. They had got a liking for the kind of comfort peculiar to the campaigner, and invented a thousand and one ingenious methods of improving the arrangements of their novel garrison. Sleeping parties had been gradually organised, and sets of seven or eight at a time enjoyed delightful nights stretched on their clean straw. Many of them would certainly not be able to get to sleep if they suddenly found themselves in a real bed, and then it is less difficult to get up when one has gone to bed with one's clothes on, and when the room is not very warm. Not one of them complained. Not one of them grumbled. We can always count on our brave fellows. All present, mon lieutenant. It was the senior non-commissioned officers of the two squadrons assembled there who reported. Every one had got up and equipped himself at the appointed hour. Not one was missing at roll call. They had all assembled of their own accord. The corporals had not needed to knock at door after door to wake the sleepers. Our chasseurs had very quickly established simple customs and rules of their own which ensured the regularity of the service without written orders. This intelligent and spontaneous discipline is one of the most admirable features of this campaign. It has grown by degrees, without any special orders or prescriptions from above, with the result that the hardest labours are carried out almost without supervision, because each man understands the end in view and the grim necessities which it involves. They understood at once that this early hour was the only one at which the relief could be effected, and every other day, just as on that December morning, twenty-five men out of each squadron get up at half-past one, equip themselves, and saddle their horses, whilst the cooks warm up a good cup of coffee for each man. Then, without any hurry, but at the exact moment, they form up in fighting order at the appointed spot, and when the officer arrives in the dark rain, wind, snow, or frost, he is of receiving the same report. All present, mon lieutenant. Quick. Mount. We shall feel the cold less trotting over the hardened roads this bright night and under this brilliant moon. Two and two, in silence, we issued from the village in the direction of R. I knew that I should find a little further on, at the crossroads where the crucifix stands, the fifty men of the first half regiment and second lieutenant de G, who serves under me. Yes. There he was, coming to meet me on the hard road. It was a joy to me that chance had given me this jolly fellow for my trench companion. I hardly knew him, for he had not been with us more than a few days. Taken from the military college directly war was declared, he had first been sent to a reserve squadron, and had only just been appointed to an active regiment. But I already knew through my comrades of the first squadron that he was a daring soldier and a merry companion. So much the better, I thought. War is a sad thing and one must learn to take it gaily. A plague on gloomy spirits and long faces. True, we can no longer wage the picturesque war of the good old days. We shall never know another Fontenoy, or Rivoli, or Illau. But that is no reason why we should lose the jovial humour of our forefathers. Thank heaven, we are preserved their qualities of dash and bravery. But it is more difficult to keep a smiling face in this hideous moral warfare, which is imposed upon even us troopers. 
all the more reason for liking and admiring the cheery officers who keep up our spirits, and G is one of them. We shook hands without speaking, for it seemed to us that if we opened our mouths, the frost would get into our bodies and freeze them, and we set off at a sharp trot along the narrow road which, crossing the high road to Paris, leads to sea. There we should have to leave our horses, cross the zone of the enemy's artillery fire, and get to the trenches on foot. The horses snorted with pleasure, happy to warm themselves by rapid movement. Some of them indulged in merry capers, which were repressed, not too gently, by the more sedate riders. The hoofs struck the uneven ground with a metallic ring, which must have echoed far, and the clink of the bits and stirrups also disturbed the sleeping country. Before us the road ran straight amidst the dark fields, a long, pale ribbon. No one thought of laughing or talking. Sleep seemed still to hover over the column, and every one knew that two days of trench duty would be long and hard to get through, even if the Prussians left us in peace. We passed a cross, which shone white on the side of the road under the pale light of the moon, and saluted it. We had known it from the first days, and had its inscription by heart. Eighty non-commissioned officers, corporals and soldiers of the 39th and 74th regiments of infantry, killed in action. Pray for them. We dimly discern the modest wreaths of green leaves, now faded and yellow, and the little nosegays of withered flowers attached to the arms of this cross, left there after the departure of the regiment, and undisturbed by any sacrilegious hand. We crossed the Paris road with its double row of trees, which in the night appeared gigantic, and after answering the challenge of the territorial guarding the approach to sea, we entered the village. It appeared to be completely empty, and yet there were two battalions of the territorials quartered there. The moon seemed to be amusing itself by casting the shadows of the houses on one side of the street upon the walls of the other in fantastic shapes. Dismount! We had reached the spot where we were to leave our horses. The men quickly unbuckled the blankets, which were to help them endure the weary hours of the following night. They slung them over their shoulders, and we set off towards the towing path of the canal. We went very slowly, as we had at least seven or eight kilometres before us, and a walk of eight kilometres for troopers laden and dressed as we were is no light matter. We found the towing path. Walking at that hour of the night is entirely not very alluring. However, the view was not lacking in grandeur. On either side of the canal the dark silhouettes of tall trees stood out against the sky. Their shadows were reflected in the water which gleamed with a metallic luster in the moonshine. How calm and silent it was! Who would have thought that we were at war? Not a cannon shot, not a rifle shot disturbed the peace of the night. Yet as a rule there were no long intervals between the reports which reminded us of the serious work at hand. That day it seemed as though some agreement had been come to by both sides to stop killing or trying to kill. However touching such an agreement might be, it would also be somewhat disturbing, for one must always be aware of an enemy who resorts so freely to tricks and traps of every kind. It was as well not to celebrate Christmas too obtrusively. Besides, I did not think that we were the only ones keeping vigil at that hour. From time to time we passed small groups of infantry, haggard, dusty, and heavily laden, marching in ranks with their arms slung by threes and fours, without speaking, striding slowly as though they were trying to measure the length of the road. Some of them were carrying curious objects fastened to sticks, pots, or big cans, perhaps baskets. Where were they going, or what were they doing? We did not ask. Every man has his own job. If those fellows were going that way, they had their orders, and nobody troubled himself about their object. All was well. The clattering of the chasseurs on the uneven road lent a little life to the picture. Perhaps they were talking together, but if so, it was in an undertone, a whisper almost. And suddenly the enemy let us know that he was also keeping watch. Far ahead of us, near sea, a rocket went up into the clear sky, and then fell slowly, very slowly, in the form of an intensely brilliant ball, lighting up the surrounding country wonderfully. We knew them well those formidable German rockets, which seemed as though they would never go out, and shed a pallid and yet blinding light. We knew that as soon as they were lighted, everybody who happened to be within range of the enemy's rifle fire had at once to lie flat on the ground, and not move or raise his head so long as the light was burning. 
Otherwise shots would be fired from all directions, mowing down the vegetation and cutting up the earth all around him. This time we were well outside the range, and we watched the dazzling star in front of us without halting. The shepherd's star, said G solemnly. Strange shepherds indeed must they have been who carried carbines as their crooks, and were provided with cartridges enough to send a hundred and twenty of their fellow creatures into the next world. The star seemed to hang for a moment some yards from the ground, then slowly, slowly, as though exhausted by its effort, it fell to the ground and went out. The night seemed less clear and less diaphanous. We had now reached the glass works, and it was there that we were to leave our cooks. No one would have supposed that this large factory lay idle, and that the hundreds of workmen employed there were dispersed. On the contrary, it seemed to have retained all the animation of the prosperous enterprise it had been before the war. It was a large square of massive buildings, almost a miniature town, planted on the side of the canal, like an outlying bastion of the suburbs of R. The low white walls, crowned with tiles, had the stunted appearance of military works, but a nearer view gave rather the illusion of the life in a busy factory at night-time. The gateway opened on a courtyard. The furnace fires shining here and there, shadowy forms passed backwards and forwards, enlivening the dim scene with the bustle of a hive. Men came out by fives or sixes, laden with different kinds of burdens, and disappeared into the darkness, making for mysterious goals. In front of the open gate other figures were unloading heavy cases from vans. These quondam glassworks were now a depot for the army supply service, and a huge kitchen which administered and fed the whole sector of trenches, of which ours formed a part. The Germans knew this. So every day, and many times a day, their guns fired a few salvos of shells on the huge quadrilateral. But our good troopers were none the worse. Instead of working in the large buildings, part of which had already been destroyed by shells, they utilized the vast basements of the factory. There were the stores, and there they had their kitchens, where they worked day and night to supply their comrades in the trenches with the hot, abundant food, which twice a day made them forget for a few minutes the hardships of the cold, the rain, and the mud. Our column halted under the bleak wall. At the wide gateway a sentinel was on duty, standing motionless, muffled in heavy grey cloak, and through it our cooks passed, disappearing into the darkness, under the guidance of the liaison officer of the preceding detachment. Whilst waiting for his return from the journey through the labyrinth, our chasseurs had a short rest before beginning the most difficult part of their journey, the last stage on the way to the trenches we were to occupy. I took the opportunity of talking with an infantry captain who was there, walking up and down with his face buried in a thick muffler with his hands in his pockets of his heavy overcoat, on the sleeves of which three small pieces of gold lace were discernible. Eh, bien, mon capitaine. Anything new? Oh, nothing. Except my opinion that you will not be disturbed either today or tomorrow. Since yesterday evening they have not fired one shot, and they were singing hymns till midnight. You may be pretty sure they'll redouble their orimus this Christmas night, so you may sleep soundly. Unless all this is merely a faint, and tonight... Yes, you're right, unless tonight. The column started, and guided by the liaison orderly, we followed the high road for some hundred yards. The shells had transformed it into a series of gorges, peaks, ravines, and hills. We had to jump over big branches cut from the trees by the projectiles. It was a road that would not be a cheerful one on moonless nights. Fortunately for us, that particular night was extremely bright. Everything around us could be distinguished. We could even divine about fifteen hundred yards to our right the solitary tree, the famous tree, standing alone in the middle of the vast bare plain, which marked the centre of our sector of our trenches, and where I knew I should find the dugout belonging to the officers of our regiment. I was very much tempted to jump the ditch at the side of the road, and cut across the fields to the final point of our march. It would have taken about twenty minutes, and have saved us a long, difficult journey through the communication trench. But our orders were very precise. We were not to take shortcuts, even on dark nights, much less on starlit nights. Our chiefs do well to be cautious on our behalf, for it is certain that though fully alive to the danger of such a route, there was not one of my hundred fellows who would have hesitated to dash across the country to save himself a few hundred yards. We came to the mouth of the approach trench. Four or five huge steps cut into the chalky clay. The frost had made them slippery, and we had to keep close to the edge of the bank to avoid stumbling. 
Behind me I heard some of the men sliding down heavily, and a din of mess tins rolling away amidst laughter and jokes. A merry heart goes all the way, and I knew my chasseurs would soon pick themselves up and make up for lost time. This was essential, for the approach trench had ramifications and unexpected cross passages which might have led a laggard astray. We went forward slowly. The communication trench was at right angles to the enemy's trenches. To prevent him from enfilading it with his shells, it had been cut in zigzags. And I hardly know of a more laborious method of progression than that of taking ten paces to the right, marking a sharp turn, and then taking ten paces to the left, and so on, in order to cover a distance which, as the crow flies, would not have been more than fifteen hundred yards. The passage was so narrow that we touched the walls on either side. The moonlight could not reach the ground we trod on, and we stumbled incessantly over the holes and inequalities caused by the late rains and hardened by the frost. Now and again we slid over ice that had formed on the little pools through which our comrades had been paddling for two days before, and this was some consolation for the severity of the frost, preferable a hundred times to the horrors of the rain. At last we debouched into our trenches, where our predecessors were impatiently waiting for us. Two days and two nights is a long time to go without sleeping, without washing, without having any other view than the walls of earth that shut you in. They were all eager to go back over the same road they had come by two days before, to get to their horses again, their quarters, their friends, in short, their home. So we found them quite ready to go, blankets rolled up and slung over their shoulders, and knapsacks in their places under their cloaks. Whilst the non-commissioned officers of each squadron went to relieve the men at the listening posts, I brushed past the men lined up against the wall, and went towards the solitary tree, which seemed to be stretching out its gaunt arms to protect our retreat. I had to turn to the right in a narrow passage which went round the tree, and ended in three steep steps cut into the earth, down which I had to go to reach the dugout. My old friend, La G, was waiting for me at the bottom of this den, stretched out on two chairs, warming his feet at a tiny iron stove perched upon a heap of bricks. By the light of the one candle he looked imposing and serious, his tawny beard, which had been allowed to grow since the war, spread like a fan over his chest, and gave him a look of Henry the Fourth. I knew that this formidable exterior concealed the merriest companion and the most delightful sly joker that ever lived, so I was not much impressed by his thoughtful brow and his dreamy eye. "'Well, what's the news?' I asked. "'We are all freezing,' he replied. I rather suspected it. Besides this fact, which we had discovered before him, La G could only confirm what the infantry captain had told me shortly before. "'You are going to have a most restful night, my dear fellow,' and I advise you to have a Christmas manger arranged at the foot of the solitary tree, and at midnight to sing Christmas Awake in chorus. We know some hymns as well as the Germans. I had no lack of desire to put this proposal into action, but such pious customs as these would not perhaps have been quite in harmony with the tactical ideas of our commanding officer. Still, I promised Le G I would do my best for the realisation of his dream. Goodbye and good luck, he said. Goodbye, I replied and he went away into the darkness. At the end of the little passage that led to the trench, I could see the men who had just relieved passing in a single file towards the communication trench by which we had come. Their dark forms defiled in closely and rapidly. Having completed their task, they were happy to be free to get back to their squadrons, and as they passed they cracked their jokes at the others who had to stay. These answered back, but not in the most amiable manner. Then, little by little, Silence settled down upon the scene. Every man was at his post. Some kept watch, others walked about in the bottom of the trench, or busied themselves with repairing or improving the indifferent shelters their predecessors had left them. G had gone to take the watch on which the junior officers of the units defending the sector relieved every other three hours. So there I was alone, alone in the midst of my brave chasseurs, with the duty of guarding those five hundred yards of trenches, a very small piece at that time of the immense French line. Behind us, thousands of our fellows were sleeping in perfect confidence, relying upon this thin rampart we formed in front of them, and farther away still were the millions of Frenchmen and French women, who under their family roof, or that of their hosts, were resting in peace because of our sleepless nights, our limbs stiffened by the cold, 
our carbines pointed through the loopholes of the trenches. Thus were we to celebrate the merry festival of Christmas. There was no doubt that far away, among those who were keeping the sacred vigil more than one, would think of us and sympathize with us. No doubt many a one among us would feel a touch of sadness that evening, thinking of his home. But none, not one, I felt sure, would wish to quit his post to get away from the front. Military honor, glorious legacy of our ancestors, who could have foreseen that it would be implanted so naturally and so easily in the young souls of our soldiers? Within their youthful bodies, the same hearts were already beating as those of the immortal veterans of the epic days of France. Men are fashioned by war. Ten o'clock came on Christmas Eve to find that our day had passed in almost absolute calm. It had been a glorious winter day, a day of bright sunshine and pure, clear air. The Germans had hardly fired at all. A few cannon shots only had replied to our artillery, which let off its heavy guns every now and then upon their positions from the heights behind us. And then night came. B and I had just finished our frugal meal. We had promised to pay a visit to the territorials who occupied the trenches to the right and left of ours. Our chasseurs had been posted in that particular section, so that in case of an attack they might form a solid base for the territorials to rely upon. They did not conceal their confidence in our men or their admiration for them, and their officers had no scruples in asking for our advice when difficult cases arose. In fact, that very afternoon, the captain commanding the company to our right had come to my dugout to arrange with me about the patrols that had to be sent that night in advance of the line. Wrapped in our cloaks, we came out of our warm retreat. The night was just like the previous one, starlit, bright, and frosty. A true Christmas night for times of peace. In our trenches, one half of the men were awake in obedience to the orders. Carbines were loaded and placed in the loopholes, and the guns were trained upon the enemy. In front of us, at the end of the narrow passages which led to our listening posts, I knew that our sentries were alert with eye and ear, crouching in their holes in pairs. No one could approach that broad network of wire which protected us without being immediately perceived and shot. At the bottom of the trenches, the men on watch were talking softly together and stamping on the ground to combat the intense cold. Those who were at rest, lying close together at the bottom of the little dugouts they had made for themselves in the bank, were sleeping or trying to sleep. More than one of them had succeeded, for resounding snores could be heard behind the blankets, pieces of tent canvas and sacking, and all the various rags with which they ingeniously stuffed up the entrances to their rustic alcoves. One wondered how they could overcome the sufferings the cold must have caused them so far to be able to sleep calmly. The five months of war had hardened their bodies and accustomed them to face cold, heat, rain, dust, or mud with impunity. In this hard school, better than in any other, men of iron are fashioned, who last out a whole campaign and are capable of the supreme effort when the hour comes. We arrived at the territorial's trench. Bonsoir, mon cher camarade. It was the second lieutenant whom I met at the entrance. He was a man of forty-two, thin, pale, and bearded. In the shadow, his eyes shone strangely. Under the skirts of his greatcoat, he had his hands buried in his trouser pockets. His elbows stuck out from his body. His knees were bent. His teeth chattered, and he was gently knocking his heels together. It isn't warm, eh? I asked. Oh no. And then you see, this sort of work is hardly the thing for fellows of our age. Our blood isn't warm enough, and however you cover yourself up, there's always a chink by which the cold gets in. The worst of all is one's hands and feet, and there's nothing to be done for it. Wouldn't it be much better to trust to us, give us the order to fix bayonets and drive those boshies out of their trenches over there? You'd see if the territorials couldn't do it as well as the regulars, and then one would have a chance of getting warm. I felt sure that he spoke the truth, and that his opinion was shared by the majority of his companions. But our good comrades of the territorial force have no conception of the vigor, the suppleness, and of the fullness of youth required to charge up to the enemy's line under concentrated fire and to cut the complex network of barbed wire that bars the road. Our chiefs were well advised in placing these troops where they were, in those lines of trenches scientifically constructed and protected. Where their courage and tenacity would be invaluable in case of attack, 
and where they would know better than the others how to carry out the orders given to us. Hold on till death. Leave to the young soldiers the sublime and perilous task of rushing upon the enemy when he is hidden behind the shelter of his fougards, his parapets, and his artificial brambles, and entrust to the brave territorials the more obscure and not less glorious work of mounting guard along our front. I could make them out in the moonlight, standing silent and alert in groups of two or three, perched on the edge of the earth which raised them to the height of the parapet, and they had their eyes wide in the open darkness, looking towards the enemy. Their loaded rifles were placed in front of them, between two clods of hardened earth. They neither complained nor uttered a word, but suffered nobly. They understand that they must. Ah, where now were the fine tirades of pothouse orators and public meetings? Where now were the oaths to revolt, the solemn denials and the blasphemies pronounced against the fatherland? All was forgotten, wiped out from the records. If we could have questioned those men who stood there shivering, chilled to the bone, watching over the safety of the country, not one of them certainly would have confessed that he was ever one of the renegades of yore. And yet if one were to search among the bravest, among the most resigned, among the best, thousands of them would be discovered. Heaven grant that this miracle wrought by the war may be prolonged far beyond the days of the struggle, and then we shall not think that our brother's blood has been spilt in vain. We brushed past them. They did not even turn around. Eyes, mind, and will were absorbed in the dark mystery of the silent landscape stretching out before them. But the night, though it was bright, gave everything a strange appearance, transformed all living things and increased their size, made the stones, the stacks, and the trees move, as it seemed to our weary eyes, cast fitful shadows where there were none, and made us hear murmurs which sounded like the muffled tramp of troops marching cautiously. Those men watched because they felt that there was always the danger of a surprise attack, of a sudden rush of Teutons who had crawled up through the grass of the fields. They had piled on their backs empty sacks, blankets and old rags for warmth, and wound their mufflers two or three times around their necks. They had taken all possible precautions for carrying out their duty to the very last. And although our hearts had been hardened by the unprecedented miseries of this war, we were seized with the pity and admiration. Presently one of them turned round and said to us, "'Hello. They're lighting up over there now.' I jumped up onto the ledge and saw, in fact, light shining in three different places some way off. After looking attentively, I guessed the meaning of this quite unusual illumination in the rear of the trenches. The lights came up from some large fir trees placed there under cover of night, and beautifully lightened up, with my glasses I could make them out distinctly, and even the figures dancing round them. We could hear their voices and shouts of merriment. How well they had arranged the whole thing. They had even gone as far as to light up their Christmas trees with electricity, so as to prevent our gunners from using them as an easy target. In fact, every few minutes all the lights on a tree were suddenly put out, and only appeared some minutes afterwards. We had thrilled instinctively. Suddenly there arose all over the wide plain, solemn and melodious singing. We still remembered singing of a similar kind we had recently heard in Bixhut on a tragic occasion. And here were the same tuneful voices again, singing a hymn of the same kind as those they sang further to the north before shouting their hurrahs for the attack. But we did not fear anything of that kind now. We had the impression that this singing was not a special prayer in front of our little sector of trenches but that it was general, and extended without limits over the whole of our provinces violated by the enemy, over Champagne, Lorraine, Picardy, resounding from the North Sea to the Rhine. The territorial trench was full of noiseless animation. The men came up out of their little dugouts without a word, and the whole company was soon perched upon the ledge. There was a silence among our men, as if each man felt uneasy, or perhaps jealous of what was going on over there. Then, as if to order, along the line of German trenches, other hymns rang out, and one choir seemed to answer the other. The singing became general. Quite close to us, in the trenches themselves, in the distance round their brightly litted trees, to the right, to the left, it resounded, softened by the distance. What a stirring, nay, 
grandiose impression those hymns made floating over the vast field of death. I felt intuitively that all this had been arranged long before, that they might celebrate their Christmas with religious calm and peace. At any other time, no doubt, many a clumsy joke would have been made, and no little abuse hurled at the singers. But all that had been changed. I divined some regret among our brave fellows that we were not taking part in a similar festival. Was it not Christmas Eve? Had we not been obliged by our duty to give up the delightful family gathering which unites us yearly round the symbolic Yule Log? This year our mothers, our sisters, and our children were keeping up the time-honoured and pious custom alone. Why did not our larger family of today join in singing together around lighted fir trees? Our territorials did not speak, but their thoughts flew from the trenches, and the regrets of all were fused in a common feeling of melancholy. Little by little the singing died away, and absolute silence fell once more upon the country. I went with G as far as his watch post. He had to resume his duty as officer of the watch from eleven o'clock in the evening to two o'clock in the morning. The post consisted of a kind of small blockhouse, strongly built and protected by two casemates with machine guns placed so as to command the enemy's trenches. A machine gunner was always on guard and could call the others at the slightest alarm to work the gun. These men were quartered in a kind of tunnel hollowed out close by and at the first signal would have been ready to open fire with their terrible engines of destruction. In the centre of the blockhouse, a padded sentry box was arranged made of a number of sandbags, in which, by means of a loophole, the officer of the watch could observe the whole sector entrusted to us, and by means of a telephone station close at hand, he could communicate at any moment with the commander of the sector at the glassworks. G had put on the goatskin coat handed to him by the officer he relieved. This officer was a second lieutenant of territorials, and looked completely frozen. "'Here, my dear fellow,' he said. I leave you the goat skin provided for the use of the officer on duty. I should have liked to give it to you well warmed, but I feel like an icicle myself. G was nevertheless glad to have it. After wishing him good luck, I left him to get back to my hut, for in spite of my cloak the frost was taking hold of me too. The faithful Wattelot had done his best to keep our little stove going. Profiting by La G's example, I stretched myself on two chairs with my feet towards the fire. I gradually got warmer, and at the same time somewhat melancholy. What a curious Christmas Eve! Certainly I had never heard of one passed in such a place. The walls were made of a greyish, friable earth, which still showed the marks of the pick that had been used for the excavation. The furniture was simple and not very comfortable. At the back was the bed, made of a little straw already well tossed over by a number of sleepers. This straw was kept in by a plank fixed to the ground and forming the side of a modest couch. Against the wall opposite the stove was the table. This table, which had to serve for writing and feeding, and perhaps for a game of cards, this table, which was required to fill out the part of all tables of all rooms of any house, was, strange to say, a night table. I wondered who had brought it there, and who had chosen it. But such as it was, it served the purpose pretty well. We used it for dinner, and found it almost comfortable, and upon it I signed a number of reports and orders. Together with the two chairs, the stove, the bed, and some nails to hang my clothes on, the table completed the furniture of the home where I meditated on that December night. The candle, stuck in a bottle, flickered at the slightest breath, and threw strange shadows on the walls. It was the hour of solitude and silence, the hour of meditation, and of sadness too, now and then. That evening dark thoughts were flying about in that smoky den, assailing me in crowds, and taking possession of my mind. I could not drive them away. It was one of those moments, those very fleeting moments, when courage seems to fail, and one gives way with a kind of bitter satisfaction. I remembered that months and months had passed since I had seen any of those belonging to me, and I conjured up in my mind the picture of the Christmas Eve they were keeping, too, at that same hour, at the other end of France. And the dear good friends I had left in Paris and in Rouen, where were they at that moment? What were they doing? Were they thinking of me? How I should have liked to enjoy the wonderful power possessed by certain heroes in Arabian nights, which would have allowed me to see at that moment a vision of the loved ones far away. 
Were they talking about me, sitting together round the fire? I thought that this war had been a splendid thing to us chasseurs, as long as we were fighting as cavalry, scouring the plains, searching the woods, galloping in advance of our infantry, and bringing them information which enabled them to deal their blows, or parry those of the enemy, trying to come up with the Prussian cavalry which fled before us. But this trench warfare, this warfare in which one stays for days and days in the same position, in which ground is gained yard by yard, in which artifice tries to outdo artifice, in which each side clings to the ground it has won, digs into it, buries itself in it, and dies in it sooner than give it up. What warfare for cavalry! We have devoted ourselves to it with all our hearts, and the chiefs who have had us under their orders have never failed to commend us. But at times we feel very weary, and during inaction and solitude our imaginations begin to work. Then we recall our regiment in full gallop over the fields and plain. We hear the clank of swords and bits. We see once more the flash of the blades, the motley line of the horses. We evoke the well-known figures of our chiefs on their charges. That night my mind became more restless than ever before. It broke loose, it leapt away, and lived again the unforgettable stages of this war. Charleroi, Guise, the Marne, the defence of Jalgon Bridge, Montmirail, Reims, Belgium, Big Chute, and then it fell back into the gloomy dugout where the flame of the single candle traced disquieting shadows on the wall. Suddenly a cold breath of air blew into my retreat. The door opened abruptly, and at the top of the steps a man, stooping over the floor of the passage, called to me in an undertone. Mon Lieutenant, come and see. Something is happening. With a bound I sprang up from my shelter and climbed up the ledge. Listen, Mon Lieutenant. That night in the trenches was destined to overwhelm me with astonishment, and this one surpassed all that I could imagine. I should like to be able to impart the extraordinary impression I felt, but one would have to have been there that night to be capable of realising it. Over that vast and silent plain, in which everything seemed to sleep, and where no other sound was heard, there resounded from afar a voice whose notes, in spite of the distance, reached our ears. What an extraordinary thing it was! That song, vibrating through the boundless night, made our hearts beat, and stirred us more than the most perfectly ordered concert given by the most famous of singers. And it was another hymn, unknown to us, coming from the German trenches far away on our right. The singer must have been standing out in the fields on the edge of their line. He must have been moving, coming towards us, and passing slowly along the enemy's positions, for his voice came gradually nearer, and became louder and clearer. Every now and then it ceased, and then hundreds of other voices responded in chorus with some phrases which formed the refrain of the hymn. Then the soloist began again, and came still nearer to us. He must have come from a considerable distance, for our chasseurs had already heard him for some time before they decided to call me. Who could this man have been? who must have been sent all along the front of the troops to pray whilst each German company waited for him, so as to join in with him in prayer. Some minister, no doubt, who had come to remind the soldiers of the sanctity of that night and the solemnity of the hour. Soon we heard the voice coming from the trenches straight in front of us. In spite of the brightness of the night, we could not distinguish the singer, for the two lines at that point were four hundred yards apart. But he was certainly not hiding himself— for his deep voice would never have sounded so rich and clear to us had he been singing at the bottom of their trenches. Again it ceased, and then the Germans directly in front of us, the soldiers occupying the works opposite ours, those men whom we were bound to kill so soon as they appeared, and whose duty it was to shoot us as soon as we showed ourselves, those men calmly took up the refrain of the hymn, with its sweet and mysterious words. They too must have come to the edge of their trench, and struck up their hymn with their faces towards us, for their notes came to us clearly and distinctly. I looked along the line of our trench. All our men, too, were awake and looking on. They had all got on to the ledge, and several had left the trench and were in the field, listening to the unexpected concert. No one was offended by it. No one laughed at it. Rather there was a trace of regret in the attitudes and the faces of those who were nearest to me. And yet... It would have been such a simple matter to put an end to that scene. A volley fired by the troop there, 
and it would all stop and drop back into the quiet of other nights. But nobody thought of such a thing. There was not one of our chasseurs who would not have considered it a sacrilege to fire upon those praying soldiers. We felt, indeed, that there are hours when one can forget that one is there to kill. This would not prevent us from doing our duty immediately afterwards. The voice drew further away, and retreated slowly and majestically towards the trenches situated at the place known as the Troopers of Seas Ground, where our two lines approached each other within a distance of fifty yards. How much more touching the sight must have been from there! I wished my post had been in that direction, so that I might have been present at the scene, might have heard the words, and distinguished the figure of the pastor walking along the parapets made for hurling out death, and blessing those who next day might be no more. Ping! A shot was heard. The stupid bullet, which had perhaps found its mark? At once there was dead silence, not a cry, not an oath, not a groan. Someone had thought he was doing well by firing on that man. A pity. We should gain nothing by preventing them from keeping Christmas in their own way. And it would have been a nobler thing to reserve our blows for other hecatombs. I know that the barbarians would not have hesitated had they been in our place, and that so many of our priests had fallen under their strokes that they could not reasonably have reproached us. There are people who will say that our hatred should embrace everything German that we should be implacable towards everything bearing that name, and spare none of the excreated race which has been the cause of so many tears, so much blood, so much mourning. Never mind. I think in this case it would have been better not to have shot. A shot fired, not far from us, on our left, brought me up from my shelter. It seemed strange after that complete calm of the night. It was seven o'clock. The sun was magnificent, and had already bathed the deserted plain, the fields, the heights of S, and the ruined village. In the distance towards the east, the towers of the Cathedral of R stood out proudly against the golden sky. I looked and saw that all my chasseurs standing on the ledges waiting with interest, a scene which seemed to be going on in front of the trenches, occupied on our left by the territorials. I got up by the side of one of them, and he explained to me what was happening. One lieutenant, it's the infantry fellows who have just killed a hare that ran between the two lines. They're, they're going to fetch it. And in fact, I saw this strange sight. Two men had gone out in full daylight from their trenches, and were advancing with hesitating steps towards the enemies. Behind them were a hundred inquisitive heads, looking out above the embrasures arranged between the sacks of earth. A few soldiers, who had come out of the trench, were even sitting on the bank of chalky earth, it was certainly such a scene as I had hardly expected to witness. What was the captain of the company occupying the trench doing? But my astonishment became stupefaction when I saw hundreds of heads that fringed the enemy's trenches. I at once sent G and a non-commissioned officer with the following order to all our men. No one is to show himself, every man to his fighting post, carbines loaded and ready to fire. The Germans opposite became suspicious on seeing our line so silent, and no man showing himself. They too waited on the alert behind their loopholes. But along the rest of their front their men kept on coming out of their trenches unarmed, and making merry and friendly gestures. I became uneasy, and wondered how this unexpected comedy might end. Ought I to have those men fired upon who were not quite opposite to us, and whose opponents seemed rather inclined to make a Christmas truce? Our two infantrymen had come to the spot where the hare had fallen, very nearly halfway between the French and German lines. One of them stooped down and got up again, proudly brandishing his victim in the enemy's faces. At once there was a burst of applause from the German lines. They called out, Kameraden! Kameraden! This was going too far. I saw two unarmed Prussians leave their trench and come forward with their hands raised towards the two Frenchmen. So I consulted G. Ought we to fire? I confess it would be rather unpleasant for me to order our fellows to fire upon these unarmed men. On the other hand, can we allow the least intercourse between the barbarous nation that is still treading our soil and our good brothers-in-arms who are pouring out their blood every day to reconquer it? Fortunately, the officer who commanded the St. Thierry artillery, and who had observed this scene with his glasses, spared me a decision which would have been painful to me 
Pong, 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 pong. Four shells passed, hissing over our heads, and burst with admirable precision two hundred yards above the German trenches. The artillery officer seemed to have placed with a delicate hand the four little white puffs of smoke which, equidistant from each other, appeared to mark out the bounds in the heavens of the frontier line he wished to forbid the enemy to pass on the earth. The Germans did not fail to understand this graceful warning. With cries of rage and protest, they ran back to their shelters, and our Frenchmen did the same. And as though to mark the intentional kindness of what he had just done, hardly had the last of the spiked helmets disappeared behind the parapets, when again the same hissing noise was heard, and pong, 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 four shells dropped, this time full upon the whitish line formed along the green plain by the upturned earth of their trenches. In the midst of the smoke, earth and rubbish of all kinds were seen flying. Our chasseurs cried, Bravo! Everyone felt that the best solution had been found, and rejoiced at this termination of the brief Christmas truce. And now our minds were free to rejoice in the great day itself, in company with our good troopers. In the night, there had arrived, well packed in smart hampers, the bottles of champagne which Major B had presented to his men, and we were looking forward to the time, only a few hours hence, when the soup would be upon the table, and we should keep our Christmas by letting off the corks in the direction of the German trenches. Our young fellow officers were already anticipating this peaceful salvo, which would certainly be heard by the enemy. End of chapter 8 End of In the Field 1914-1915 by Marcel Dupont. Recording by FNH. Visit www.bookranger.co.uk.